Hey, welcome everybody to River Rock Fellowship Online Messages. I'm Pastor Marvin. And if this ministry has been a blessing to you, please share that link with your family and friends. If you're a guest, I want to encourage you to go to rrf.church and check us out. We're going to get right into the Word, but let's watch this video opener for the message first. God bless. Oh, ah, oh, that's all. Seriously? Okay. Oh. Where is it all going? Please, please, please. Yes. <laughs> Why is this happening? No! It's 12.78. All right, let me get you uh... <laughs> um, uh... No, buddy, no, no, buddy, no, no, buddy. Are you taking things for granted again? Yeah, I guess so. All right, well, is there anything you can do about that? Because we really need to do some laundry. Laura, will you please give me a more grateful heart? Honey! My car! Okay. What a great reminder. Note to self, be thankful for what you have been given. Let's open up with some prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. And Lord, as we're in the, this November season, this Thanksgiving season, help us, Lord, to be more grateful. Father, to be more thankful in all things. To see how important it is to recognize all that you really have given us. And things that we sometimes just take for granted. Lord, be with us today as we study your word. We pray your will, we pray your way in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Friends, I, uh, I stand before you a little torn and with some mixed emotions. On one hand, I'm deeply grateful to be an American. But on the same, at the same time, I'm a little disturbed by the events of the past couple of weeks. Yet the word of God is clear that I am, and so are you, to be thankful in all things. So let me start with this little story. Someone wrote this and they said, One day I got into a taxi and we took off for the airport. We were driving in the right lane when a car suddenly just bolted out of the alley right in front of us. My taxi driver slammed on the brakes, skidded, and missed crashing into that car by inches. The driver of the car was now with his head out the window, showing some freeway language and yelling at the cab driver. My taxi driver just smiled. And then just kind of waved at him. I asked, why did you just smile and wave at that crazy guy? He almost caused a car wreck. That's when my taxi driver taught me a lesson of a lifetime. He explained that many people are just like garbage trucks. They run around full of garbage, full of frustration, full of anger, full of hatred, and full of disappointment. And as their garbage just piles up and piles up, they need to dump it all. 
And sometimes they look to dump it on you. But don't take it. Don't personally receive it or personally be offended by it. Otherwise, if you take it, then you in turn can dump it on your family, your friends, your neighbors, and anybody in the community. Just smile, wish them well, and move on. Hmm. You see, what you focus on, what you let your heart be offended by, generally will determine the kind of decisions you will make and the kind of life you are going to live. Her name is Ella Wilcox, and she wrote, One ship sails east and another west with the selfsame winds that blow. Tis the set of the sail, not the gale, which determines the way they go. See, when a person's offended, You choose which direction or the position of the cell of your heart, the position of your life in which way it's going to go. It's the Apostle Paul today we're going to study. And he has some great advice in Philippians. In Philippians 4, 8, it says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to focus on all the negative in your life? The mainstream media does. Seldom do they feature positive news. But today, let's break that pattern. This time, I want us to look at Paul and how he focuses on all the positive while he is in the midst of some of the most serious negative situations there can be. What an incredible example. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 23, Paul mentions some negative things that are going on in his life. But while he's doing that, he's really focusing on on things to give praise and thanks about. You see, he faced some very unpleasant circumstances, some unreasonable people, and some uncertain, an uncertain future. I think we can all face that and look at those and say, I can relate to this guy. Paul goes on to show that God was able to use those negative things in a very positive way. So if you have your notes and you want to follow along, it, there in the handout, Paul faced some negative things in his life. Number one, like unpleasant circumstances. Paul begins by talking about these unpleasant circumstances in his life. Verse 12 of chapter 1, Philippians. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me was at, has actually served to advance the gospel. Paul chose to see the positive in his unpleasant circumstances. Why? Because Paul understood the power of praise and the triumph of thanksgiving. Paul clearly has faced serious trouble and difficulties in his day. I mean, this guy had been shipwrecked. He'd been bitten by a poisonous snake. He had been beaten nearly to death, publicly humiliated. He had been unduly arrested many times, chained up and in prison 24 hours a day, in some cases while chained to a Roman guard. And yet Paul says, I remember all these trials, and I see that they have all served to advance the gospel. Now, That word advance, wow, what an incredible word. It's literally translated in the Greek as as something incredibly interesting, historically speaking. It originally was used for the woodcutters who would go out before the army and cut down the forests and, and the undergrowth to make a way so that they wouldn't be impeded so that they could advance easily and effectively when the army came. So Paul's saying, all these things that have happened to me 
have resulted in clearing the way so that the gospel might advance more effectively. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 13, we continue to read, As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Now here's the situation. Here's the backstory. 24 hours a day, Paul the Apostle is chained, is handcuffed, to a Roman guard for six hours at a time. Four shifts, six hours, different guard every shift. Now, Paul saw this not as a horrible situation, but as a wonderful opportunity to tell the soldier he's chained to about Christ. And it was so effective that we find out through these through these scriptures, that many of them became Christians, even though they were Roman citizens. It says in Philippians 4.22, All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong, hear this, to Caesar's household. Now that tells us that some of the soldiers became Christians. And the gospel made its way into the pagan household of Caesar through the guards. And all because Paul, the prisoner in chains, saw it as a wonderful opportunity to share Jesus with the Roman guards who couldn't go anywhere because they were chained to Paul. Wow. There was another positive, another thing to give God thanks from these unpleasant circumstances. Verse 14 in the same chapter. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul saying, because of my hardship, because of the things that have happened to me, other Christians have been encouraged. They have seen how God has encouraged and, and protected me through these difficult situations, and even giving me strength beyond my own power. Now they're facing difficult circumstances as well as Paul. But because of what they see happening in Paul and his incredible heart of thanksgiving and praise and strength in the gospel, they're convinced that God will take care of them as well. Folks, when we look at all the unpleasant circumstances that we're all experiencing in our nation right now, riots and uncertainty about a presidential election, it's just blue, red, nobody's happy with each other. Um, we don't trust what's coming across the airwaves and media. It's difficult. And yet, our nation, as a positive, is no longer apathetic as the American church. Our apathy is gone. Our American church, I don't care the denomination, is praying more now than it has ever prayed in decades, if not generations. This is exciting to see that the body of Christ is active, actively reading the Word of God, actively praying, actively searching for answers. That comes because of some of the circumstances we're in. And for that I give praise. For that I give thanks. There's a story about a man who had a, a good friend. But his friend had a severe heart attack, and he, he almost died. But he was now well on his way to the road of recovery. And on visiting his friend, Joe asked, Hey, George, how do you feel about your heart attack? And George answered, I hate it. I mean, what do you think? It nearly killed me. Then Joe asked, Would you like to have another one? Uh, hello? No? Would you recommend it to someone else? 
Absolutely not. What are you doing, Joe? Joe went, George, George, now that you're feeling better, do you treasure your life a little bit more? Well, of course I do. Yeah, I guess I do. You and your wife have always had a solid marriage, George. But would you say now since the heart attack that you're even closer now? He goes, well, Joe, now that you say it, yeah, we are closer. And what about your relationship with God? Has that changed since your heart attack? He says, yes, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm much more closer to him now. I can't wait to spend time with him, actually. He said, George, in light of all of this, how do you feel about your heart attack now? <laughs> well, I guess I'm grateful for it, since you think of it that way. You see, God can take the most negative things that happen to us and make them positive. If we just focus and look for and seek to find the good in it all. So like Paul, with unpleasant circumstances, what might be chained to you this day? Are you chained to loneliness and grief and despair? Are you chained to a declining health? Are you struggling because of the election or the unclear future? Find the positive and then give God thanks. So let's look at number two. You know, Paul faced some negative things in his life. Number two, unreasonable people. Have you ever faced an unreasonable person? We all have. Paul did as well, and he says in verse 15, Philippians 1, 15, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. Now, now Paul's saying there are some people who are just envious of him, and they see themselves as rivals to him instead of teammates. They're, they treat him as a competitor. Well, what happens is when people become envious of somebody else, they usually try to tear them down. They point in all the negative that they can find in that other person, thinking that by pulling them down, that that actually lifts them up. But the truth is, it doesn't work that way. Even as Paul was writing this letter to the Philippians, he right now is actually in prison. And yet they're still going after them. He was actually in prison because of false accusation by the Jewish religious leaders. And so now the Romans have him in prison. So listen to what Paul wrote in verse 18. But what does it matter? Can, can you hear this? I know the false accusations. I know there's people out there trying to be competitive when they should just be on the same team. He's, he's looking at all this. He says, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether with, excuse me, from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. <laughs> wow, I mean, Paul was able to find the positive no matter how negative it really was. He saw beyond it. Here's a third one. An uncertain future, number three. Finally, Paul mentions this uncertain future in Philippians verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Now, Paul's facing trial in Rome. He is, if he's found innocent... He'll be released so he can go preach the gospel again. But if he's found guilty, he's going to be executed. He's faith with release, I preach. 
Found guilty, I'm dead. Yet in Paul's writing, he's just quite calm. And he's grateful. So he writes in verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will know in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. You hear what he's saying? He's saying my concern is whether I stand before a pagan judge or a pagan court that I won't do anything to embarrass the gospel in Jesus Christ. I pray that I have enough courage to stand up in the midst and that of this court and that I may, what I would say and what I would do would not embarrass Jesus Christ. All I want to do is to exalt the name, the name of King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus. Let's go to... Philippians 1.21 For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Let's go to 22.23 If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. He recognizes if I get to stay, I get to do work that will have eternal impact on souls. But I really want to go be with Jesus. I just can't wait to be with him. Kenneth Dodge tells about an eight-year-old boy named Frank. Frank had a date with his dad to go fishing on Saturday. And they were going to go fishing the whole day. And on Friday night, well, little Frankie had everything laid out. It was all ready to go. All he had to do was wake up and put it on, and out into the truck we would go. But when Saturday rolled around, he awoke to the most incredible storm. I mean, it was raining cats and dogs. So little eight-year-old Frankie, he grumbled and griped all morning long. He kicked the furniture, and he kicked the dog. Nothing was right. Why does it have to rain today, Dad? His dad says, Well, son, you know the farmers need the rain. But that didn't satisfy little Frankie whatsoever. Well, about noon, well, it stopped raining. And Dad looked over at his little Frankie and said, Frankie, maybe we can't go fishing all day, but we can go for the rest of the day. Come on, let's do it. So they took off and they went over and they got to fishing. They caught more fish in those few hours than they had ever caught in like two days. Couldn't believe how great the fishing was. They got home and mama got the fish. Dad had cleaned them, of course. And she had made a fish dinner, put it all on the table. And dad looked over at little Frankie and said, Frankie, would you pray the blessing over our meal? And Frankie said, Oh Lord, if I sounded a little grumpy earlier today, it was all because I couldn't see far enough ahead. That's really the problem, isn't it? We get so caught up in the unpleasant circumstances, the unreasonable people, and the uncertain future that surrounds us that we just can't see far enough ahead to see what God's doing. But when we take the time to focus on the positives, to give God thanks in all things, not for all things, but in all things, and we trust Him, we will begin to see the hand of God moving on a wonderful future for all of us. One day, We'll be able to see him face to face. And he'll answer all our questions. But I imagine by that time, it won't even matter. Well, Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. And if there's somebody watching 
and they hear this message and they recognize that maybe they've been a Christian for quite a while and, and Lord, they've, they've encountered that unpleasant circumstances and unreasonable people and an uncertain future and they feel distant from you because it's hard to give you thanks. God is calling you and saying, hey, it's time. It's time to rededicate your life to Him. Or maybe you've never asked Jesus into your life. Maybe you've never said, Jesus, become the Lord and the Savior of my life. I want to invite you to do that right here, right now. Would you pray this with me? Dear Jesus, be the leader of my life. Be the Savior of my soul. Forgive me of my sins. Make my life as white as snow. Jesus, I love you. Forgive me for my sins. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for me. Well, if you prayed that prayer, it's real and it happened. And heaven is celebrating on your behalf. Well, church, I want to bless you and thank you for watching this and ask that you come on back again soon. God bless you.